got people online. Sorry? We got people online. Yeah. So I think they're just letting them in from the waiting room. Good to go. Okay. So let's jump in. Um, so I have introduced myself, but for the people online, um, my name is Haley LaMonica, and I'm a clinical neuropsychologist by training and a senior research fellow um, at the Brain and Mind Center at the University of Sydney. Um, so I've worked in a lot of different aspects of research, but the main theme that ties it all together has been digital technologies and how we can capitalize on technologies to improve healthcare services and improve outcomes really across the lifespan. So today I'm gonna to be focusing on a project that focuses on the first five years of life and trying to improve outcomes for children in those early years. Um, before I get started, I want to recognize and pay my respect to the elders and communities of the lands on which we're meeting today, the lands of the Gadigal people. For thousands of years, they've shared and exchanged knowledges across innumerable generations for the benefit of all. Okay, so I know we have parents in the room, <laughs> um, at least three. Um, so, and I'm sure that you all know that the first five years um, of life really represent a very vital, critical period of development. We were just chatting before while we were waiting to get started about how much you can even see developmental changes just overnight in young children. Um, and really importantly, we know that the, the those early development um, that the early development of those skills, social, emotional, and cognitive skills during those early years, they have direct relationships to outcomes in later life. So outcomes with regards to social functioning, health outcomes, and economic outcomes as well. So it really points to how critical those early years are. Now, unfortunately, we also know that around the world, millions of children are failing to meet their developmental milestones. Um, so, for example, we have data from 35 low and middle income countries, which shows us that about a third of children who are three to four years old are failing to attain their basic social, emotional and cognitive um, developmental milestones. So we really have an opportunity to intervene um, and to make a difference. So really importantly, the developmental processes um, for young children are really strongly influenced by the environment in which they're raised. And we need to think about this really across multiple levels. So it's not just the family home, although that's very important. Um, so we can think about, you know, what are the activities that young children have access to or are able to engage in? What are the, the relationships they have? You know, who are the critical people in their life? And this can obviously be mom and dad, but it can be siblings, it can be extended family members, important members of the community. What are the networks that they're exposed to and a part of? Again, this can be the, you know, the community in which they're raised. It can be um, religious networks that they're raised in, educational networks. Um, and more broadly than that, what are the resources they have available to them? These might be you know, resources within the home. Do they have access to educational materials, books, music, that kind of thing, as well as within education settings? And then we also need to think more broadly just about the political and cultural and contextual factors that impact on how children are raised and the environments in which they're raised. So I often think, for example, are boys and girls given equal opportunities from a developmental perspective? So um, many of the factors here presented in this um, wheel are what we refer to as social determinants of health. Um, and they're really very generally associated with mental and physical outcomes later in life. Um, and as you can see here, really the influences on a child's development are very multifaceted and very connect interconnected. And there's lots of um, opportunities both for positive as well as for negative um, Im impact on development. So we're gonna start on the negative side of things um, and talk about adverse childhood experiences. So adverse childhood experiences or ACEs um, are potentially traumatic events that occur early in childhood. And they're really recognized as established risk factors for mental health problems later in life. So for example, children who are exposed to abuse or neglect um, or dysfunctional home environments, this might be domestic violence, um, this might be you know, parental separation or divorce, 
Um, these children are at, our hi are at a higher risk of then developing depression and anxiety, conduct disorders, and ADHD later in life. And you might think, you know, but at least not very many children experience these um, these um, ACEs or these adverse childhood experiences. And unfortunately, that's not the case. Um, so we have data from Australia that it's estimated that 72% of children have been exposed to at least one of these adverse childhood experiences. And then this rate is much higher in, in more vulnerable populations. So children from um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait uh, Islander groups, juvenile offenders, um, and children involved in welfare services. So I'm gonna borrow this video from um, Dr. Dr. Jack Shonkoff, who is the director for the Center of the Developing Child um, at Harvard. And he's gonna help us understand how stress and these negative or adverse life experiences early in childhood impact development, both in terms of physical health outcomes as well as mental health outcomes. And I will acknowledge that the video is quite US centric, but really the message is appropriate global, globally. development story has been a powerful influence on the growth of investments in programs to promote early learning and enhance school readiness. But the brain does not exist by itself. Connecting the brain to the rest of the body is critically important. Early childhood experiences are as much about lifelong physical and mental health as they are about early learning and readiness to succeed in school. All biological systems, all of them are highly interconnected and all of these systems are primed to adapt to whatever the environment would throw at us. Think about this as a team of highly skilled athletes. Each has a role to play, but they depend upon each other. They influence each other's responses. Like any good team, it's how they operate together that is the key to their success. When we are stressed, every cell in the body is working overtime. The brain is the master control system that detects threat and then manages the response of all of the different systems. It sends signals to the cardiovascular system to increase heart rate and blood pressure. Signals are picked up by metabolic systems to increase the availability of blood sugar to provide more energy stores for the body. The immune system is activated to be on alert for the possibility of a wound or the need to protect against infection. The neuroendocrine system is activated to increase levels of stress hormones in the bloodstream. All of these also provide feedback to the brain. The stress response system was designed to deal with an acute threat or challenge. But when the stress continues at a very high level, then these biological responses actually start to have a wear and tear effect on the body. This is where stress explains chronic disease. The science is really clear. The most costly chronic diseases in our society have their roots in early childhood. Cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and depression, three of many diseases that are associated with greater adversity early in life. Those three diseases together consume more than $600 billion of healthcare costs a year. So if we want to think about preventing disease and promoting health, it doesn't begin with exercising more and eating better when you're 30 or 40 years old. Health promotion and preventing disease begins prenatally and it extends into the early childhood period. Connecting the brain to the rest of the body has very important implications for early childhood policy. If we look at the basic science-based principles focused on early learning, strengthening relationships, building skills, reducing sources of stress, those are the same principles that increase the likelihood for lifelong physical and mental health. And when we think about the major sources of adversity early in life, we talk about poverty, discrimination, exposure to violence, maltreatment, child abuse, and neglect. Although each of these sources of adversity differ from each other, biologically, the effect on the body is the same. Systemic racism, the dangers of implicit bias, and everyday discrimination impose a level of stress and adversity on families of color raising children that is present all the time. It's never too late to make things better, and we are biologically prepared to adapt to whatever environment we live in. But we need to look upstream 
at more systemic issues that are the sources of this the Center for the Developing Child um, that are yeah, very helpful and, and yeah. lots of information about early childhood development. So as you hear, heard at the end there, Dr. Shankoff says yeah. we are biologically prepared to adapt to our environment. So it's really important to take that in because it doesn't mean that if you're exposed to one of these adverse childhood experiences or one of these detrimental um, social determinants of health that you are headed on a trajectory for negative health outcomes. But we need to figure out what kind of what can we put in place to help support children in those early years so they um, are able to reach their full developmental potential. So now we know that responsive and nurturing caregiving can help mitigate some of these risks associated with these social determinants of health and help us um, as a community and as parents promote healthy early development. Um, so the World Health Organization and UNICEF has come up with the Nurturing Care Framework, which outlines how countries, communities, and families, so really taking a very holistic approach to children, how these groups can provide environments to ensure that children have access to good health care and proper nutrition. That's really a core foundation. How we can protect children from threats. Now, this is threats of abuse and neglect, but it's also thinking about environmental stressors, things like air pollution, um, as well as provide them with opportunities for, for new learning. So again, as I said earlier, do they have access to educational materials? Are, are are people telling them stories, reading them books, singing songs, that kind of thing? Um, and finally, are, are the caregivers in their lives providing them with responsive and nurturing care? So do those caregivers recognize what's happening for their child and respond to the needs of that child actively? And really what we know is caregivers who are able to provide this responsive care are also better able to attend to those four other components of the nurturing care framework as well. Now, really importantly, the Nurturing Care Framework recognizes that all parents need access to this kind of evidence-based um, parenting education um, and support to help them be the best parents that they can and help them, help, help them help their children reach their full developmental potential. Um, and parenting or child-rearing programs are really an important opportunity to intervene early in a child's development. Um, so I think, um, I'm not sure if you're a first-time parent, First time parent? Yeah, so I think um, it can be really overwhelming, right? Uh, lots of questions come to mind and it's really important that people are able to have a, a solid resource that they can access um, to answer some of those questions um, that are just bound to, to come up. I don't think we're born as parents who just say, okay, I know how to do this. There's definitely some things that come as instinct, but there are a lot of questions that arise as well. So parenting programs are really opportunity, really good opportunity to help educate parents and upskill them in where they have questions. Um, and we do know from research evidence that parenting programs do actually result then um, in positive out outcomes for children in terms of um, psychosocial and cognitive development. And um, to be effective, it's recommended that parenting programs promote positive parent-child interactions, um, consistency in parenting behaviors and practices, so responding in the same way each time to children's behaviors, um, the development of emotional communication skills, so again, being able to help your child recognize the emotions that they're feeling and helping them learn strategies to manage those emotions. Um, and then it, really importantly, not using punitive or physical disciplinary methods. So despite knowing that these kinds of parenting programs are effective, both for parenting practices, but well, as well as with the knock-on effects for young children, demand for this kind of parenting information on a global scale is quite low. And that's for a couple of reasons. One is stigma. Um, so again, I think there's an assumption that parents should just know what they're doing. You should know how to raise your child. Um, and then also there's just really a lack of awareness, I think, for a lot of people that the these first five years are really important. So you hear from parents, but they're just lying there um, or, you know, they, they don't have language. They're not engaging with me. But that doesn't mean that they're not little sponges sucking up every little detail that's happening in their environment around them. And that's why it's really important to be actively engaging with children um, right from the moment of their birth. So to kind of tackle these demand issues, we know that digital solutions um, that 
that enable more flexible um, delivery of information can be really impactful. And importantly, it allows parents to access this kind of uh, information in the privacy of their own home, in the privacy of their own phone, and at their own convenience. So they don't need to be traveling to healthcare centers or meeting with other groups. Um, they can really find access to this information at their own convenience. And this is an important way to overcome this kind of challenge for trying to deliver whole of population um, programs. So again, as the nurturing care framework says, all parents need this kind of information and technology is a really powerful tool in terms of getting that information out there. So what's currently out there for parents um, in terms of child rearing information, in terms of apps and those kinds of things? So um, there was a systematic search done in the US in January of 2022 of Apple and Android stores, um, looking at free parenting apps that focus just on those first five years of life. And what the review showed is that the tools that were out there, they largely focus on just providing general, generic, non-personalized advice um, and then also tracking parenting and developmental milestones. But there's really not a lot out there that's specific to focusing on social, emotional, and cognitive development in the early years. So that brings us to the program that I've been leading at the University of Sydney, um, which is funded by Mindaroo Foundation, um, and it's called the Thrive by Five International Program. So um, the vision for this program is to inspire an increased understanding of and focus on the importance of early childhood development. Um, and the, object the objectives are to empower parents and caregivers with the knowledge and the information they need to really best support their children in these, in these early years um, and to ensure universal access to this kind of information, regardless of where you live, your socioeconomic status, your gender, your religion, et cetera. Um, uh, really acknowledging that all parents should have access to this kind of information. So um, importantly, and I'll go into this in more detail, um, we've been working primarily in low and middle income countries, and we always develop the app in collaboration with parents and other caregivers and subject matter experts in those countries um, to make sure that the content and the app itself are appropriate um, for them and meet their needs. So it's not one Thrive by Five app. At this point, I think it's 11. <laughs> um, so there's a unique version of the Thrive by Five app for each country in which we're working. So to give you a sense of where we've been, um, the first app was launched in Indonesia. We've been in um, a lot of Central Asian countries, Afghanistan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, a lot of um, uh, Africa, Kenya, Namibia, Cameroon, Democratic Republic of the Congo, Ethiopia, um, and then Malaysia as well. So quite a global project. Um, it's been really fascinating um, to learn about um, early childhood development and how it plays out in each one of those countries. And importantly, the app is always free to use. Um, and the app is really considered the flagship of this program, but recognizing that there are gaps in terms of access to technology and di digital liter literacy, um, we do have alternate means of disseminating the content as well. So just briefly, so my team at the University of Sydney um, is responsible for leading the content um, development process. So we have developed all the content that's embedded within the Thrive by Five app. So importantly, um, the content is all underpinned by a scientific framework, um, which highlights key neurobiological systems that we know are really critical to early childhood development. So this includes things like the oxytocin system, which is really important for bonding um, and the development of strong social skills, as well as the circadian system, which is really important um, for developing, uh, for the circadian system, for developing that sort of 24 hour circadian clock um, and establishing healthy body clocks. And then you'll see on the column on the right there, um, the more colorful column, that the content is grouped into domains that are meant to be a bit more user-friendly um, for parents and caregivers. So we're focusing on um, cognitive development or play, social development, or what we call connect, the development of language and communication skills. So what we call talk, um, physical, healthy physical development, which we refer to as healthy home. And then um, what's somewhat unique about Thrive by Five is we're also focusing on helping children identify or develop their own sense of identity um, and a connection with their family, their extended family, their community, and their culture as well. Now, in relation to that last point, it's really, and as I sort of alluded to earlier, it's really important that parenting programs aren't just designed as a one-size-fits-all, um, but rather they really need to be developed and tailored to the cultural context in which they're implemented. 
Um, and cultural adaptation of these kinds of tools are really um, important way of addressing racial and ethnic disparities in terms of access to care, um, the quality of the care, or just the quality and access to even just this kind of um, early childhood education um, information. And perhaps it should go without saying, but culturally adapted interventions, um, we know from research are, have been shown to be much more effective than those that are left unadapted. So you can't just pick up an intervention that's been shown to be effective in Australia, pick it up, put it in Kenya, and it's, it's gonna have the same effects. Um, so we really need to be attending to culture and context. So to do that, um, before we start developing any content or working in a country, um, my team does a really deep dive into all of the social, historical, political, um, anthropological, gender-based, religious, you name it, we're looking at it, um, all of these factors that impact on child-rearing practices in a country. And we really wanna develop our own understanding of the sociocultural context in each country before we're, we're start, starting to engage with parents and before we're starting to develop that content. So <clears throat> for each country in which we're working, we bring together that scientific framework that I referenced, so those reference to those key neurobiological systems. We bring that together with our new cultural understanding of the context, and it's only then that we start to develop the content. So I keep referencing the content. What is the content? <laughs> um, so we refer to um, the content as collective actions. And that term collective is um, really deliberate in nature because we know in a lot of societies, it's very much a collective approach to child rearing. So it's not just the mother child dyad. It's not just mom and dad and the child, um, but grandparents, aunties and uncles, trusted members of the community are all really vital and play a really important and quality role in raising children. So that's why we've used, we've selected that word collective. Now for each collective actions, uh, they are comprised of two parts. One being the why, um, which provides scientific information about early childhood development, which we try to present in really approachable lay language um, so that it's easy and user-friendly, um, easy to understand and user-friendly. And then each one of the whys is coupled with one or more child rearing activities that again, parents, but also um, extended family members or members of the community can engage in with the child to help promote that aspect of development. And for each country in which we're working, we embed within the app more than a hundred of these collective actions. They're all grouped by those domains that I referenced and then um, tagged with ages as well. So you can really filter to find the activities that are best suited um, to your needs in terms of your child and your family. And then we always try to find opportunities to localize the content. Um, again, recognize the importance of local, localization in that, into that cultural context. Um, so we try to embed within the content examples of local songs, local dances, local stories, local um, authors, foods, festivals, all of those kinds of things to help the content feel more approachable and feel more familiar to parents and caregivers. So I'll just give you an example here of how we do this. So you'll see on the left there, the left panel, that's the why. Um, and so here we're talking about dance and the importance um, of dance or the power of dance um, in terms of development. So we talk about dancing supports development of different important motor skills, helps children develop an awareness of their surroundings and where their body is and in the environment. And it helps children engage with their culture's dance and music. Um, so this why panel doesn't change. The science isn't gonna change no matter what country we're in. Um, but then the activities that are tagged to it, that's where we try to include those local examples. So the middle three here, that's all the same content, which we've then localized to different countries. So you'll see in those red boxes for Kyrgyzstan and Indonesia, where we've embedded slow and fast paced songs that um, are, are familiar locally. Um, and then in Namibia, it was actually recommended to us that we that that including local examples would actually potentially be quite off putting or exclusive, because there's such a culturally diverse and ethnically diverse <laughs> community, they felt that if somebody came along and saw something that was from another tribe or another community, it might actually be very off putting and actually be a very bad user experience for them. So they recommended throughout the app that we not include local examples. So all this work goes into developing this initial content base. Um, and then we populate this into a test app. 
um, that we then give access to parents and caregivers and subject matter experts in each of these countries to give them an opportunity to really actively test out the content, try the activities with their children, what works, what doesn't. And then we run a series of what we call co-design workshops, um, actively bringing together parents and caregivers so we can hear from them what are their needs and what are their feedback, what's the feedback on what we've done to date. So when I say co-design, what do I mean? Um, so co-design is a phrase that you hear in research around digital technologies all the time, but what, what actually does it mean? So it's a process in which you really are trying to bring together all the key stakeholders um, that are involved in the product or might use a product. You bring them all to the table to allow them to have their say, to provide their input. Um, and the aim is really to ensure that whatever that end product is, it's gonna meet the needs of the intended user. So it's a very collaborative co-design, co-creation process um, where you bring together, in this case, parents and caregivers, as well as the individuals that have expertise on the ground in terms of early childhood development, alongside ourselves as researcher, researchers, as well as the tech team and who's developing the actual product. You bring us all together um, to make sure that we're we're building a, a tool that's going to um, be the most effective it can be for the end users. So you'll see here from the quote, in participatory design, the people destined to use the system play a critical role in designing it. Um, so in each country, we're running a series of co-design workshops um, and we wanna gather feedback on whether the content we've developed is culturally appropriate and relevant. Um, but we also take this opportunity to hear from parents you know, what are the gaps in their knowledge around early childhood development? You know, what questions do they have? What questions do they have now? If they think back to when they were first time parents, what were the questions that they were encountering? What are the behaviors or the skills or the values that they're looking to instill in their children from a young age? And again, besides parents, who are the other important caregivers that are involved in a child's life? And should we be developing content specifically to them for them to help support the development of the children? And then, of course, we're always looking at um, gathering feedback on the user experience and different ways of implementing or disseminating the content. So let's talk about some of the examples of how these co-design workshops actually informed the content development. So um, I will say for Afghanistan, we were involved in Afghanistan both before and after um, the fall of the government for the Taliban. Um, yeah. And uh, this example here was from the work that came after, so came in early 2022. So we heard from experts how important it was um, to provide activities that could be done indoors because mothers um, are the primary caregivers for children and they're largely restricted to the home now, um, both for safety reasons as well as just general new gender restrictions. Um, so they wanted to make sure that um, any activities uh, that were specific to being outdoors, so going to a park, going to a playground, there was an indoor alternative so that those could still be useful to parents. So you see here from one expert, um, some parents have a phobia about letting children go outside and explore. There could be explosives and bombs outside. We need to consider the safety issue for children. And this particular expert, um, he developed, he had taken one of his whole room, uh, rooms inside the house and he'd kind of padded it and created an indoor sort of cricket um, stadium for his children so that they could still have some exercise, but do it, do it safely. So it was pretty interesting, very creative. Um, and in the Dem Democratic Republic of the Congo, food security was raised as a really critical issue. Um, and we learned that many children um, do not have multiple meals a day. Um, many will just have the one meal. So it was re recommended that we remove any reference to breakfast or dinner and just refer to times of days at times of day and at, that you might eat. So you hear, see from the expert here, you find that you can just afford to give children one meal per day, not even two meals. And then in Malaysia, um, we learned that it's really uncommon to bathe children in the evenings. Um, and we had included this in the content as a way of setting up a bedtime routine and helping sort of set children up um, to, to be going to bed. Um, and this was not gonna be appropriate for Malaysia. Um, so they recommended that we include reference to bedtime stories um, as opposed to using the bath as an example. So these really highlight how the content was adapted, um, but we also often um, identify through the co-design workshops gaps in the content that we need to fill for each country. Um, so this is an example from Kenya, where we heard from experts 
that they really wanted us to be providing um, women with specific information about um, pregnancy and what they can expect during pregnancy and in the first few days after birth um, to promote maternal and infant health. Um, so here in Healthy Mother, Healthy Child, um, we highlight how important it is for women to take care of themselves physically and emotionally during pregnancy. Um, and then we also provide specific examples for how they can do this. So looking after their physical health um, through eating healthy foods, drinking water, exercising regularly and getting good rest, um, also attending to their mental health um, and well-being. And we also highlight how important and critical it is um, for other family members to support um, pregnant, pregnant women um, to, and to be able to engage with the child in utero as well. And I also thought I'd take this opportunity just to show you that um, the content is for each um, app. It's also translated into one or more local languages, again, to ensure accessibility. Um, in this case, it's Swahili. And I'll just show you that it's also all audio recorded um, so that parents with lower levels of literacy or who just prefer not to read, um, they can listen to the content. So this is in Swahili. So no one in this room, I'm guessing, is going to understand it, but I'll just show you the how it works. <laughs> okay, so I've talked a lot about the app. I'm going to take a little break um, and just give you a, sense, uh, a chance to see one of sort of the promotional videos. And this shows you more of the screens and, and the different functions and features of the app. There's no shortage of apps that are available for any number of topics, um, but it's important for all of us to recognize that um, most of the apps that are out there have never been trialed or researched in terms of their usability or their acceptability or their effectiveness, and that applies to early childhood apps that are out there as well. Um, mm -hmm. oops. Um, so we want to take things a step further, but beyond just the co-design and the implementation of the app, so we don't want to just put it in the app store, say here, great, use it. We actually wanna see if we're hitting the mark. Um, so we really advocate just as we had that very iterative process in terms of working directly with parents and caregivers and subject matter experts to develop the content to make sure that it fits their needs. 
we actually want to do that after we implement it as well. So we can have parents and caregivers out there using the app, using it in their communities, using it with their children, trying out the activities and, and actively pro providing us feedback um, with how it's working or not working for them. Um, so, you know, one of the beauty of things that's beautiful about technology is it's really easy to adapt. Um, so if we're getting negative feedback about things, we can remedy that really rapidly um, to try to optimize um, the effectiveness for users and ultimately improve outcomes for young people. So um, our team has been doing just that. Um, so in the countries where Thrive by Five has been implemented, um, we've been running an evaluation study looking at the impact of the content on child rearing practices, on the confidence of, of, child, um, of, of people raising children um, in terms of parenting knowledge, um, as well as the, the relationship or the connection that children have with their parents, with their extended family members, with their culture and with their community. So I just wanted to take this opportunity briefly um, to share some of the highlights from our results. So um, across all the countries in which we've been working, we've been seeing um, really quite uh, consistently that parents are reporting that engaging with the activities in the app is making them feel more connected to their child. Um, and really importantly, as I, as I said earlier, um, physical punishments um, are one of those adverse childhood experiences. So they've reduced, um, a, you know, again, consistently we're seeing that there's been a reduction in the use of harsh or punitive disciplinary methods. But we're still seeing this kind of broad um, lack of knowledge about factors or, or important things that just can be done routinely day to day, like including your kid in cooking or making music with your child, singing songs, dancing, these kinds of things, how important these can be and impactful they can be from a, from a developmental perspective. So in terms of this last point, I wanna show you some data from the evaluation we conducted in Uzbekistan. Um, <clears throat> so what you have here is data that's collected at three different time points. Um, so we wanted to see if, if um, there was a change in knowledge over time as people had more chance to engage with the app, engage with the content. So time point one was two weeks after the app was implemented, time point two was 10, and time point three was um, 24 weeks. So increased exposure, does it um, translate to increased knowledge? So you'll see we're seeing a positive pattern in that, that middle screen around um, making music where people are increasingly recognizing, um, still not great results there, um, but increasingly recognizing that making music with children can contribute to development. But unfortunately, we're not seeing any progress in terms of recognizing that engaging in creative play with children or um, storytelling with children can impact development. So there's still pretty notable gaps in terms of understanding some of the practical things parents can do to influence their child's development. So are you saying the understanding of that's lacking? So there's, yeah, the knowledge of that is lacking, yeah. So when people were asked, does creative play support a child's brain development, more than half are saying no. Really? Yeah. And that didn't improve over time. So we have work to do. <laughs> um, so in Indonesia, um, we saw a really interesting distinction in terms of impact between rural and urban communities. Um, and we think that this relates to in, in the urban settings, there's a lot more access to healthcare, and there's just a lot more access to information about early childhood development. Um, so we think that in the rural settings, this was more unusual and therefore had a greater impact. Um, so one of the mothers said to us, in the community, we have so many apps, but there's none as comprehensive as the one you have. And there's none which gives me the opportunity to learn from A to Z in one place, anything I can possibly need, I can find in the app. And what was really um, great to hear is that parents were able to reference the material in the app to decide um, if they needed to go to a doctor. So in rural communities, attending a doctor can be a really time consuming and expensive um, endeavor. Um, and so they were able to make use of some of the information in the app um, to, to help them make these decisions. And also we heard that just the really simple messaging in the app really had an, an impact in these communities. So one mother was able to use the hand washing information in the app um, to bring a diarrhea outbreak in a village under control. Um, and in Indonesia, we learned there really isn't a, a culture of reading. So people just don't go home and read a book um, or read books to their children. So this was really new information to parents um, and they were trying to spread that within villages as well. Um, we also learned that um, by communicating information through the app, 
mothers were then sharing that with other caregivers. And again, thinking about this collective, they were bringing consistency into the care that was provided to their child. So one mother um, said that her mother who often cared for the child was even then even more careful in taking care of them now, even compared to her. Um, so you can see how the information can be shared. You don't necessarily have to have the app, um, but those users can then disseminate it themselves as well. And finally, again, recognizing that not everybody had technology, not everybody was going to use an app. Um, the partner that we were working with in Indonesia, they started facilitating some workshops in these rural communities to be able to disseminate um, the content just via word of mouth. Um, and we learned in Indonesia that sort of the group learning setting is much more preferred than learning on your own. Um, and again, we heard here from this facilitator that in East Java, where a lot of the women have um, low economic and educational backgrounds, their enthusiasm was clearly different than when she ran these workshops in urban settings. Um, mothers came very enthusiastic. They came from 8 a.m. even before 8 a.m., where we start at 9, and participants were taking it as their knowledge to bring it home and ready were ready to share it with others. Um, so again, you can see that it's very empowering to the mothers themselves, but then they also saw it as their responsibility to disseminate that um, within their communities as well. Um, now in Afghanistan, um, we sort of had the tale of two groups of mothers. Um, so one of the scales that we use, um, it's, a, it's a validated tool that helps us look at changes in parenting practices in, in response to, to engaging with a parenting intervention such as ours. And we looked at, when we looked at the overall score on this measure between male care, care, caregivers and female caregivers, there was no difference. But when we looked just in the mother's group, um, there was a pretty striking difference between these two groups of mothers. So in one group, um, we saw mothers reporting higher levels of stress and sadness and lower levels of life satisfaction and familial support. And then in the other group, we saw pretty much the opposite. So lower levels of stress and sadness, higher levels of life satisfaction and familial support. And really importantly, the latter group was also reporting an increased use of the positive, nurturing, responsive caregiving practices. So here, it's really important to recognize that there's a direct relationship between a mother's mental health and well-being and the child-rearing practices that she's able to put in place in her home. So we really need to be providing content to, to support a mother's mental health and parents in general, um, but in this case, it was mothers specifically. Um, and again, it's important to think back that this the, the parents' mental health is one of those potentially adverse childhood experiences. So again, it drives home the importance of making sure the parents are well um, and taking care of their own mental health to ensure that they can set the child up for success. And finally, um, taking us back to Uzbekistan one more time, um, again, another one of those potential adverse childhood experiences, I want to look at um, coercive parenting practices. So this is from that same scale I was just talking about. And the questions around coercive parenting, um, they ask parents as to whether they shout or get angry with the child when they misbehave, if they make them feel badly for misbehaving, or if they spank or smack the child if they argue with children or if they get annoyed with the children. Um, and so we were asking about changes in this behavior after engaging with the content. So again, you have three time points here, one, two, three at the bottom. Um, let's just for the sake here, just focus on the dark color. So that's the whole group. Um, and importantly here, lower scores are better. So lower scores mean more, the use of more positive nurturing care practices. So you'll see from time point one to two and three, that there's a pretty consistent reduction. There's a little bit of variability between two and three, but that was a significant change from time one to time two. So we are seeing that engaging with this kind of educational information for parents is shifting um, the way that they are disciplining their children. Now, it's really important to recognize that it's not that the app came in and fixed things, um, but I think what we've seen is that um, the content allows parents to have the difficult conversations with each other, but also really importantly with um, the, uh, you know, often multi-generational care caregivers in the home um, that might have more sort of traditional um, authoritative uh, caregiving methods. So it's a way of um, actually starting a conversation and potentially shifting some of those practices. Um, so we saw here, um, again, these, we, we actually spoke with some of the parents in this evaluation. So you saw here from a mother, I'm sharing this message from the app with neighborhood girls, with neighborhood brides, 
And I'm also sharing message with my workplace and telling everyone that we shouldn't beat kids and we should use polite ways to educate kids. And also we need to explain to them what is bad and what is good so they will learn, they will become better children. So you can see here that it's not just around the physical discipline, but actually helping children understand what are the behaviors that are actually expected of them. So what's considered good behavior and what's considered bad behavior. So helping them understand, um, again, what their parents are looking for them, for, for them, um, from them, for from a behavioral perspective. And then we also heard, I learned from the app that I was raising my children in a very rough way, in a very strict way. I was swearing and yelling at my kids. I also beat them. And if they didn't, if they did something not good, I always use this method as trap trap method. And now I'm realizing that I shouldn't use these methods. Nowadays, I'm using the beautiful words, polite ways to educate my children. And I'm also using the smart way of educating my children. So we talked to the translator that we were working with about this term polite, because we weren't quite sure what it meant in this context. Um, and she said that it was really about trying to use smarter ways of parenting. Um, and she said it was, quote, using my brain instead of using my hands or being physical. So again, it's not that the content has fixed things, but I think it started a conversation that's important um, to shift parenting practices. So just to wrap up, we certainly know that technology is not a cure-all, um, but I think we've shown in this research that it's a really powerful tool. So through this app, um, we've really had the opportunity to empower parents and caregivers, extended family members, all of those people that might be involved in raising young children about the importance of nurturing child-rearing practices to support healthy early childhood development right from the get-go. Um, and again, we've, en we've enabled parents to access this information at their own convenience, and then to be able to share it with their own communities as well. And to take us back to the beginning, really, there's a, there's a tremendous power in being able to educate parents and caregivers, right? Parents and caregivers of young children, they have the opportunity to protect their children from these adverse childhood experiences. And where they can't, they have the ability to set up the, this enriched environment in which to help them sort of buffer against um, the risks of having been exposed to adverse childhood experiences, really to prom promote healthy development in the early years. So I just need to give a shout out to my team at the University of Sydney. Um, as you can tell, there's a lot of moving parts um, to this project and none of this would be possible without all of them. Um, and just acknowledge also Mindrew um, as our partner and funder in the project. So that's it for me. I don't know if there's questions from the room or questions from Zoom. I'm happy to talk further. Well, I've got a few questions. Do you want a mic? I might just give this gentleman. Yeah. Oh. Thank you. Congratulations on what you're doing, by the way. Thank that's you. Great. Um, if you take uh, identical goldfish and put one out in the wild and put another one in a tank, uh, that the cognitive challenges of avoiding predation and getting food and everything result in their brains ending up twice the physical size. Mm. And I'm just wondering whether PET scans and so on, is, are there differences in the actual visible differences in the brain development from people who get this degree? degree of enrichment in their upbringing? Yes, yes, there definitely are. Um, I am not an imaging specialist, so I'm not going to tell you what they are. <laughs> um, but um, I'm happy to, to share more detail later. Um, but yes, there's definitely differences in brain development in, in um, the num number of synapses and the connections that develop in the brain um, that we see over time. And, and the, you know, as you saw, the, the impact of that sort of chronic stress um, definitely has an impact on on brain development. So I'm happy to give you my card and you can email me and I'll find more detail for you. <laughs> can I ask another one? Yeah, by all means. Um, I think you're the star now. <laughs> um, I, I'm wondering, I'm, I'm sure you do have this, but is there, are there sort of, um, uh, is there advice on how to actually use this app? I mean, I'm imagining maybe there should be a checklist or something where you could say at the end of a few months, what have I done about foreign language exposure? What have I done about social connections yep. uh, and how you, and I'm imagining these poor women in some of these poor countries with a lot of kids very little money yeah the the actual workflow if you like around the app is yep. that something you've 
Yeah, so great question. Um, so first off, we've tried to um, create activities that don't require um, anything purchased. Um, so we're, we're always trying to rely on local materials or if you don't have a ball, we tell people they can you know, ball up socks or they can create something out of um, string or paper and all those kinds of things. So we try to keep everything um, very feasible. Um, regardless of resources. And then um, we've created what we call starter packs. Um, so if people are looking for sort of a guide as to how to get started for different age groups, but we haven't been prescriptive. We very deliberately haven't been prescriptive about how much people should use the app or how many activities they can do. There is a tracking feature so they can see what they've done over time and, and track their history. Um, but what we were hearing from parents right from the beginning is mothers in particular um, were reporting a tremendous amount of guilt um, for not having done the right things previously. Um, and it was, as mothers globally are, tend to be the primary caregiver, um, they were seeing it as another thing that they had to do. Um, so we were, we've were we been very cautious about setting out any sort of schedule or any sort of minimum um, standards for use to avoid creating that additional burden or that additional stress for, for parents. But there is an ability for them to sort of track things over time. Thank you. Anything on Zoom? Uh, nothing on Zoom. But, okay. Um... Oh. <laughs> as a parent I've, I've logged on to the research um thrive by five it's it's available on the app store as well it's actually not available in australia yet right. yes um but mindru is bringing it back home um and is looking to do a lot of this same work for the australian context um uh but the i think it's bright horizons is one of the i've got bright to bright bright tomorrow sorry yeah, sorry that's, yes that's good. bright tomorrow's um, is is has served as sort of a foundation for the work that we've taken internationally. But Vindru is working um, to bring a, a domestic Thrive by Five to Australia, but we've only focused on low and middle income countries to date. Yes. Right. And I have to say, I'm very impressed. We have five people in the room and four of them are men. Um, I, I don't know what our gender group is online, um, but this is the first, uh, we rarely get men involved in the workshops and things like that. So I really appreciate your thoughtful um, attendance and comments. Yes, yeah. I'm just curious, um, how do you uh, promote the app in various um, cultural contexts? And um, what are your plans for um, potentially expanding the program uh, to other regions, um, particularly I um, would be curious in areas where might be uh, conflict affected mm -hmm. um, regions yeah. that yeah. might benefit. Yeah, 100%. So um, Mindru really uh, takes ownership of the dissemination and the promotion process, but um, they work directly with, um, we always work it with at least one um, partner within the country. Um, and then sometimes there's also a marketing or an advertising agency involved as well. So the strategies have been vastly different um, and have been really, again, tailored to each country in which we're working. So um, they often do, uh, there's often sort of uh, family day kind of activities at the initial launch to bring communities together to have them sort of try out the different activities. So they have the um, materials that they might do to try out the different activities. Um, and but we've seen really everything from um, you know video materials and and things like that in in the Demo Democratic Republic of the Congo. They put some of the activities as they made them into songs um, because that was a really familiar way of communicating information. Um, so that was really creative and wonderful to see. Um, in Namibia right now, they're trying to take the um, activities and translate them into cartoons, again, to make them more approachable. Uh, in Kyrgyzstan, we saw big banners on buses and there was Thrive by Five on the back of every bus seat and all this kind of stuff. So really, it's run the gamut. Um, lots of social media pr um, promotion. Um, in Indonesia, I think it was, they, um, you know, they worked with influencers on social media uh, as well. So it's really been vastly different. Um, and Mindru at the time, at currently my understanding is they're exploring different opportunities. Um, Ukraine is, is one in terms of conflict area um, or conflict afflicted area. And the, the question there is around, um, would we work in the Ukraine or do you work with the refugees who fled the Ukraine and, and how does that work in terms of the countries that you might work in? 
Um, uh, we have been engaged with Afghanistan right from the beginning. Um, so that's been really interesting um, to learn about and to see how things have evolved. Um, interestingly, the primary facilitators that we've worked with in Afghanistan have always been women. Um, so our partner there is the Bayat Foundation. Um, and they run all the major television and media centers in the country. So they've been able to capitalize on their own network um, to advertise the app, and they're continuing to do so. Um, the government there is aware of the app, um, but uh, you know they have permission to, to market it in that way. Um, and um, I think where, I'm not sure where things are up to, to be honest, with the Ukraine discussion, um, but it was very much around how we needed to create more sort of trauma specific um, content um, and make sure that there might be a more sort of um, package, a, a trauma package there, as opposed to more broadly focusing on early childhood development, providing more targeted content. Maybe just one more? Yeah, go for it. <laughs> just curiosity, sorry, curiosity more than anything else. But if you look at the list of actual your actual content, it looks very like a list for of happiness in life generally. Actually, cognitive, you know, challenge, uh, yep. play, uh, stories. Yep. Um, so I guess what you're saying is we should start all that as early as possible. But um, if you wanted a list of how to be happy in retirement, it'd probably be a similar <laughs> list. It's, pro it's probably very true. Um, and I will say that um, a lot of the, um, particularly the mothers that we've worked with, the idea, particularly around the emotional development, um, there's really not, a, in a lot of countries in which we've worked with, people don't learn how to express their emotions. They don't learn the language to about how to label emotions or, and because again, with the, the idea of that sort of collective society, you're, you're meant to swallow your own emotions for the betterment of the group around you. Um, so we've really been struggling with, uh, you know, that sort of, um, we don't want to push our culture um, or our ideas on other groups, um, but providing this kind of information about the benefits of, of sharing emotions um, has been really interesting. And again, a lot of the moms have been talking that they really need to learn this information first um, before they can help. They see the value in it, but they struggle to have these conversations because they don't have the skill set yet. Uh, yet. So um, there's been a lot of benefit for caregivers as well from a, from a knowledge perspective. Um, and as we've been working, we're thinking we probably need a, a whole, we do have some content specific to the caregiver, um, but we probably need a whole another content stream um, specific to caregivers. Yeah. We do have one question that just popped up. Yep. Um, question here. Um, I'm not sure if you answered this already, but is the app offered in those local languages? It's it's offered in each of the country in which it's implemented. It's offered through the local um, uh, Apple and Android stores, and it's always available in one or more. So it's always available in English, but then in one or more local languages. Um, I think Malaysia is the only country where it's av available in four languages. So English, um, Malay, Chinese, and Tamil. Um, so we're always working with our partner to identify the language, the languages that are going to create the most access. You think you know, <laughs> well, interestingly, UNICEF has yeah. their own early childhood development app called Bebo, B-E-B-B-O, um, and they've worked in a lot of the same countries. Um, so Mindrew and UNICEF are considering partnering um, to try to bring all of that content together. Um, but the styles are quite different um, in terms of the content. Um, so I'm not quite sure how that will how that will work, but that's for somebody else to decide. <laughs> Great. Thanks so much. <laughs> What's that? Thunder supplies. Pretty pretty good for five.
Um, for those at home as well, and for here, we're going to put up a QR code for you oh. to pop your. That's okay. That's for us to announce. Um, to uh, tell us what you thought of of the event and uh, provide provide your thoughts uh, to a culture council link. That's right. Thank you.